Welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar on pulse disease diagnostics. My name is Claire Brown and I work with the Birchip Cropping Group. I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability. The purpose of today's webinar is to give new and existing pulse growers an update on pulse leaf disease diagnostics. Now, before we start the webinar, everybody should be muted. We will take questions after the presentation and the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows you to ask questions. So if you see a button for Q&A, you can click that, then open the window and type your question into there. This webinar is also being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, if you have technical issues or you would like to share this, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Now let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Dominie Wright from Deep Herd in Western Australia. She's based in Perth. Dominie has over 20 years experience working as a plant pathologist. Dominie provides training courses to agribusinesses, consultants, growers, and staff on disease identification. She also enjoys running webinars. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Dominie. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon, everyone. So today's topic on pulse disease diagnostics is extremely broad, um, and I'll only be covering a small section of it. So um, pulses or grain legumes in, grown in Australia cover lupins, field peas, chickpeas, faba beans, albus lupin, lentils, and yellow lupins. All of these crops are susceptible to either fungal diseases, bacterial diseases um, on their leaves or upper stems. They get root diseases caused by fungi or nematodes, and they're also all susceptible to viruses. Today, I'm mainly going to concentrate on uh, the foliar diseases that these crops get. So on the screen, you will see that there are um, or you, I've grouped the foliar diseases into to the main ones, which is ascochyta and botrytis, which is what I'll be mainly talking about today in describing these symptoms in these crops. Um, all of the crops are susceptible to sclerotinia, and over the last um, few years, we've seen a huge increase in sclerotinia being present in crops. There are also many other diseases which I won't be covering today, um, just due to time limitations. So on this graph, you can see that field peas, chickpeas, barber beans and lentils, which we mainly think about as our pulse crops, are susceptible to ascochyta, botrytis and sclerotinia. Lupins don't tend to be, uh, don't get infected by um, the pathogen that causes ascochyta blighting or the other pulse crops. Um, they are, however, susceptible to botrytis and sclerotinia as well. I've just stuck up here um, the different types of rhizoctonia root diseases that we see in these particular crops, as well as sclerotinia doesn't, doesn't just cause leaf diseases, it can also cause a stem um, disease on all the crops. All of them are susceptible to different types of rhizoctonia, and then there are other pathogens that cause root disease. So just on here, looking at rhizoctonia, um, rhizoctonia comes in what we call different ZG groupings, and they're related to the type of crop. So just for quickly, just running through it, um, cereals are mainly susceptible to ZG1, which is also known as um, AG8. So that's rhizoctonia salinae. Um, this AG8, which causes bare patch, is the other name of it, um, infects pulses, lupins, and canola. Pulses also get a hypercodal and a root rot, which is caused by the different groups um, within rhizoctonia. 
And that's all I just wanted to point out to you today. So if we're just moving on to the Ascochitis species attacking pulse crops. So they're all susceptible to the fungal pathogen Ascochita, but there's different species that affect these crops. So Ascochita pinodes um, infects field peas. Ascochita radii affects chickpeas. Ascochita fabiae affects barber beans and Ascochita lentis um, infects lentils. There's been very many different name changes over the years um, with all the advent of being able to do um, DNA analysis on these fungal pathogens, but I've decided for this sake of this presentation, we'll just keep referring to them as aspect fire. So a generalised life cycle on um, Aspicida is shown on the screen now. So here we have two main ways that um, the disease continues in the field. We have infected stubble, um, which if you go and plant in on top of an old crop, you will get an increase of Aspicida occurring in your crop, regardless of which crop it is. And we also have um, seed infection where the ascochyta has moved up the branches, infects the seed pods and then infects the seed. It remains in the seed so when you've got a plant you're actually planting out infected material and your crop will have ascochyta as seen here. This is just showing you um, what the fruiting bodies um, look like on the stems of plants under a microscope. They are the sexual stage, which allows the fungus to over survive over summer on the stubble. And here we have the, um, the assay with the aspospores that are released when the stubble over the winter months when you crop the particular rain and temperature climates. So the asexual stage, which is what we find on the leaves, is rain dispersed and um, only survives on the stubble. Very, I mean, very short-term stubble survival, I suppose we can call it. The sexual stage, which is what we're showing here, which survives on the stubble for the long term, um, these spores are dry spores, they're wind dispersed, and that's what infects your crop if you happen to go in and you plant on top of the previous crop. So the main management packages for Ascochyta in all of these crops is rotation so that you allow the breakdown of stubble in the field. You also need to isolate your paddocks so, um, by distance because it's been shown that the spores can move over a long distance. Um, you need to use um, a look at your varieties for resistance and make sure that you use one that's um, the least susceptible. Seed testing is important um, for some of the crops and not so important on the other crops. And the rest of what I've written on this slide you can read. So when we're looking at um, Ascochyta in field peas, it's Ascochyta pinoides. Which we, if we know the disease rather than Aspicida, we can call black spot in field peas. So here we have a diagram showing you the black spotting that occurs on the leaves and the lesions that, as they get bigger, they coalesce or they get larger and then they form together. This disease also affects the stems and right down onto the crown area of the field peas. And here we have another one where we're showing you the effects of stubble versus um, no stubble. If you can plant into a wheat crop rather than a previous pea crop, you will reduce the amount of black spot that will come up from the soil. And here on this one, we're seeing a lot of black stems affecting the field peas. Then if we move into chickpeas, which is Ascochyta rabii, out in the field, you see lots of patches. Um, they're quite distinct patches. The plants, if it's growing from seed, will germinate and die off quickly. 
otherwise it will just spread throughout the canopy. If we look closer at the plants, you will see these round lesions on the leaves with black spots in the middle. Now, the black spots in the middle are fruiting, uh, the fruiting bodies, or media, and they contain the spores that then um, splash up onto other leaves or to the next plant. Um, so the main method of spread in chickpeas is it's more so from infected seed rather than stubble, but stubble born, the stubble does play a role. On this photo, you can see where the petioles and the stem of the plants are getting the shepherd's foot from where it's been infected, and they look quite bumpy and dotty, which is again um, the fruiting bodies present on the plant. Then, if we move to fiber beans, um, we have Ascocarpa fabiae um, on the beans, and in this scenario. Stubble is more of an issue for spreading the disease than it being seed borne. On this photo, you can see again the lesions that occur on the stems from the Aspopyra, and there will be fruiting bodies present here. But when it infects the seed, you will see large um, black lesions with not necessarily see the fruiting bodies on there, but you'll get these definite black lesions on them. So the main thing to remember with fiber beans is that seed borne is, is a minor component of spread of the disease compared to stubble. If we again look at the leaves close up, you can see the initial infection place and then you will get more sections of the leaves dying off as infection spreads. And again, we have the pit media present inside the lesions. On a distance, on the stems, you'll see small lesions with a brown um, edge to them with the black media inside. Now there's a number of other um, leaf pathogens in fiber beans that people can mistake for Aspopyta. This one on the left is what we, is really, is caused by Alternaria. It creates these target rings on the leaf and you won't see any of the black fruiting bodies that we see in Aspopyta. So this is a close-up of Aspopyta with the black fruiting bodies. The other leaf disease that can occur on fiber beans is septoria, but I'm not talking about that today. And now if we go on to lentils, here again we see very similar symptoms to what you see on chickpeas. You see the tops of the plants once they've been infected, but the leaves die off and the petioles die. The lesions on the leaves are very similar again to chickpeas, the circular lesion um, with black medium in the middle. So that's all about Ascochyta. Now if we're going to talk about botrytis, in these um, crops because it is a major issue, um, especially if the weather conditions are quite um, warm and moist and if you've planted your crop with a very high density, you'll find that it's more susceptible to the botrytis. There are two main botrytis type um, pathogens. We have botrytis cinerea, which has an extremely wide host range that will infect all the crop all the pulse crops except for faded beans. And then we have um, the Tritus baby, which causes the disease chocolate spot. The interesting thing with the Tritus baby is it generally only infects faded beans. However, lentils are susceptible to both types of the Tritus. The lentils will get um, chocolate spot and the Tritus granule. So on this slide, we have a very simple disease cycle to show you. Here we have um, the stubble the cycle where the pathogen will try to survive on the stubble and can infect a new crop. And also the botrytis is seed born. So if you plant infected seeds, you'll have an infected crop growing. 
So the main management issues with botrytis to control it is you've got to do rotation, so move away to allow the inoculum to break down in the field. Isolate your paddocks so they're a long distance away from the previous year's stubble and get your seed tested and if need be, treat it to ensure that it will follow botrytis. So botrytis in chickpeas is a, is a really big issue. Here we have um, from a distance in the field, you won't see the big holes that you tend to see with Aspokita. There's more yellowing and dying off of selective plants, but as the disease progresses, you will get those larger holes and paddocks. In the paddock. And just a close up, you see how the whole plant has started dying off from the botrytis. And you still have some healthy stems present as well. And just a close up um, on here, on this leaf, if you look closely, there is some grey fluff present um, on the leaves and going down the pediol. So botrytis really looks like the old, the fluff that you used to get on the old grey tennis balls from a long time ago. Um, that's the easiest way to think of what botrytis looks like. On this picture, there are some other areas where the botrytis is getting in, affecting the leaves. On this photo, it shows the stems being infected by botrytis. Again, you've got this grey tennis ball buzz occurring on the leaf, on the stems, and here we've had leaves already die off. In these photos, we have um, pods showing infection, whole plants being taken out. And if we go and look at the seed, so this seed here on the right is healthy seed, and this seed on the left is infected seed with botrytis, and the seed tends to be a lot more shriveled and quite disappointing. Then if we look at um, botrytis in fava beans, which is the disease is called chocolate spot, this is mainly stubble borne and seed borne. So on the leaves, we have these round, browny red lesions that tend to be scattered. But as the disease progresses, these lesions all form to all coalesce together to form larger lesions. Uh, here's a close-up, but um, the disease, there is another issue that can occur on harbour beans, which is caused by red-legged earth mites. These two diseases tend to get um, mixed up together when you're not very familiar looking at them. This picture here has some small spots caused by red legs and they tend to be more on the underside of the leaves and fibre beans than on the top side, and the chocolate spot tends to be more on the top side of the leaf. So they're the main fungal diseases that we have in, um, in our house crops. There's another one that does occur quite regularly if we have cool wet weather while the crop is at seeding stage which is down in mildew in peas. So this is mainly stubble borne and can be seed borne. It causes um, a yellow down, a white fluffy down on the underside of the leaf. It does not occur on the top side of the leaf. Um, it is wind borne um, from this, during those cool wet weather, the spores spread. In WA, we have found that fungicide sprays aren't warranted. The crop will grow out of the disease um, over time. And here's just another close-up of downy mildew. This one's got quite a um, severe infection where you can see the white powdery down on the underside of the leaves. The other main disease that we see in field peas, I hear that it's been a very large issue in um, the eastern states last, last year, which is bacterial blight. 
Now, bacterial blight is caused by the bacteria Pseudomonas syringi papillae pisei, um, or it can be caused by Pseudomonas syringi papillae syringi. This bacteria is seedborne, so it lives under the seed coat of the seed. Um, during showery weather, the, if it's infected, if the leaves are infected, the um, bacteria ooze out, and then that's by rain splash, it's spread over to other plants. So what we have found, though, is the bacteria will not infect the plants unless the leaves are damaged. So, in terms of this, that means that if you've had a frost or hail or um, sand blasting occur on your crop, it's going to be more susceptible to bacterial blight if the pathogen is around. Just a reminder that fungus side sprays do not work on controlling bacterial blight because it's a bacteria. Um, and the biggest way to control the disease is by testing your seed. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Dominique. Um, just opening it up now to any questions. Um, there's a Q&A button down the bottom if you'd like to type a question in there from anyone there. Um, Dominique, I've just got a quick question. Yes. Um, about bacterial blight. Uh, you mentioned that's being seed borne and, and we should get the seeds tested. Whereabouts should we should growers send their seeds for testing um, and how long would it take to get the results back uh, pre-sowing this year? Okay. Um, so for bacterial blight, I understand that I'm the only one now providing that test for growers. Um, because we've had people ring up from New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia asking if we can test the seed. We can test the seed, we can just say whether it's the bacteria is present or not present. We're not able to give a level of infection for bacterial blight. The test takes um, two weeks now to do. It was three weeks, but we've been able to split it up with a new way of identifying the bacteria. Um, so that's probably the main thing. For other testing of seed, which we recommend with botrytis and ascochytos, um, I'm pretty sure most departments, their local government and department can do it. If not, we do provide that test to people. And they just need to contact me if they uh, are interested in having that test done. I do also know that the DPI in Victoria offer virus testing for boxes, which is also another important um, matter for people to do. Thanks, Dominique. Um, I've got one other question. This I know we don't know what the, the season's forecast is going to do and how wet it may be this year, but are there any diseases that spring to your mind, Domini, given that the eastern states have had a bit of summer rain? Anything that springs to mind that growers should be looking out for as we head into season 2020? Um, I think that growers should really consider their, um, their rotations and, um, and be very mindful of with this, especially with um, field peas, it's really important for black spot that they um, select their paddocks that are further away from last year's crop um, to reduce the risk of and the level of black spot that they are getting their crops. So as the spores are uh, able to travel over long distance distances. And there's also um, an app now available for everyone, which is the Black Spot Monitor. Um, so those are the main important things, I think, for this year going into the season. Yeah, thanks, Dominique. Some really important message there about um, paddock selection and selecting it away from not being too close to last year's susceptible crops. 
Uh, we haven't had any further questions, so I'll finish it up there. So if you are looking for any further information on pulses, GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during 2020 to bring you the latest pulse information. We have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for existing and new pulse growers. If you have any suggestions or requests for things that you'd like to learn about pulses, or you're interested in being added to the distribution list, then please let me know. Um, the best contact for myself is email, which is claire at bcg.org.au. Thank you, Dominique, for a fantastic presentation today. Thank you, Claire. Uh, yes, and thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thanks, Dominique. Thanks.